Thank you, Dawn, for reading the scriptures. I didn't want to read it because there's some really big words at the beginning. Save me stumbling over them. <clears throat> By way of introduction, all I have to say is if anyone falls asleep during my sermon this evening uh, and falls off their chair, and it's perfectly possible, um, we only have first aiders uh, on hand this evening. So um, there's no Apostle Paul available to come and put you back together not even the grand old Duke of York with his 10,000 men or whatever. But uh, a friendly, just a friendly warning that uh, this is something which was uh, extremely rare in the scriptures. Uh, but uh, we'll come along uh, with that. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, following the riot in Ephesus, Luke now narrates uh, how Paul quietly left Ephesus after about three years. Well, no, he didn't leave quietly, did he? He didn't leave quietly at all. Paul could never keep quiet about the gospel because we read in verse 2, he travelled through that area speaking many words of encouragement to the people. Paul could not keep quiet. There had been a riot. His life was at risk, as it was many times. Do you think it kept him quiet? Did, he, did you ever think he was just going to slip away without anyone noticing? No, he was a man who could not keep quiet concerning the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He travelled through that area speaking many words of encouragement to the people, we read. And then he finally makes it to Greece and stays for three months. Now, let's see if we... Okay, got some... Uh, thank you. Let's put that up. Um, he wants to get to Jerusalem quickly. This is where the, he will finish. This will be the end of his third missionary journey in Jerusalem. And he has a deadline. He wants to celebrate Pentecost with them. So he's a man on a mission and he's moving very quickly uh, to uh, visit some of those uh, in, well, he doesn't actually go to Asia, but a little bit further down, he stops off at some of the ports. Uh, but he is a man on a mission. And do you know, there is already just a small parallel, a little parallel, as Paul walks in the footsteps of his saviour. Like Jesus, Paul was travelling um, with a, a group of disciples. Like Jesus, Paul was opposed by hostile Jews wanting to kill him. Like Jews, J Jesus, Paul had predicted three times that his life might be taken. And like Jesus, he was ready to lay it down. Luke records in his gospel in chapter 9, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And now we read of echoes, if you like, from Paul the Apostle. He also set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus would go, though, to be the Passover lamb. Paul would go for Pentecost. That's where the difference or the similarity stops. So in verses 5 and 6 then, when we look at those verses, I won't be able to read them all because it's a big chunk of scripture. You'll have to read them as we go along. The little band of followers splits up for a while. Uh, some went on ahead to Troas, but Luke specifically says, we, we sailed from Philippi. After the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were obviously meeting with Jewish believers at that place. They joined the rest of the team in Troas. So firstly then, we see a life saved. We see a life saved. Luke makes it clear from the outset that he was an eyewitness to the death and resurrection of Eutychus. When he says in verse 7, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. He was there. He was with Paul. He was by his side. And this is probably one of the earliest pieces of information, or so, it's so unambiguous uh, bits of evidence that fellowships met uh, and believers met on the first day of the week to break bread. Bread. 
It was an evening service, and Luke understood this fellowship meal as clearly as anyone. After all, he would, he would write about it in, in his gospel, chapter 22. And it was, it was a late one. It was a late meeting. Um, it went on longer than we'll be going on tonight. That's a promise. He was intending to leave the next day. So he was trying to cram as much as he could into his preaching before departing the next day. It was a farewell sermon, if you like, to those at Troas. But Paul was still preaching at midnight. I think that perhaps uh, the apostle Paul had been, pre uh, had been preaching here. Someone may have, if he'd been preaching here, someone might courteously have said something like, um, uh, maybe brother will come back tomorrow. Maybe at midnight someone might kind of slip out quietly at the back, uh, but not when Paul's preaching. Actually, I was once at a fellowship, and I went over time, and I was about two minutes over the 7.30 finish, and I was about to announce the last hymn when someone called out to me, Brother, our time has come, just close in prayer. Now, uh, maybe it wasn't a great sermon, or perhaps they uh, wanted to get home for a cup of tea, um, but they certainly encouraged me to close the meeting in prayer. Um, uh, I'm sure that with Paul, though, preaching, they hung on to every word and uh, they were enthralled by what he had to say. So he was preaching till midnight. However, this young man, Eutychus, a young lad, obviously very tired. I mean, who wouldn't be at midnight, let's face it. And although there were many lamps as we read in verse 8, there were many lights on, probably wasn't as light as it is in here, um, we see that this young man um, kind of is overcome with tiredness. Perhaps he'd been up work early yesterday, the day before had been, had been the Sabbath for them. So it would have been permitted for him to perhaps work. Um, perhaps it was a little stuffy in there. We know what it's like in here, don't we? It gets a bit warm, a bit stuffy, our eyelids get a, a little bit heavy. And he realised that those extra long blinks were going, to t were going to turn into closed eyelids. Maybe because of that he moved next to the window. We don't know, for some air. But whatever the reason, an accident happened. And he fell from what we would term a, a third floor outside onto the ground. I've read some pretty tenuous thoughts on the passage, like... Um, he should have been listening intently to the preaching, and that's what happens when we switch off. I thought it was a little harsh. They listed some consequences. Uh, another one, another commentator said he should have sat on the floor, perhaps like everybody else, but boys have to climb. Someone else said that this demonstrates the danger of being on the outside or the fringes of a meeting or a fellowship. We need to be at the centre. Uh, some think that this was the hand of Satan trying to disrupt the meeting. To be honest, I've got to say, I don't see anything like this. And certainly Luke makes no mention of any condemnation. He doesn't condemn the young man. There's no harsh words toward him. He was simply over, overcome with sleep and tiredness. And he fell from the third floor. And it was enough to kill him, and he died. It is important to note that he was not unconscious. It's important to note that he was not just stunned. Luke, a doctor by profession, would have been able to detect if he was. He would have known, he would have seen the signs if this man was actually uh, still a, a alive or not. And so this man of the medical profession. He bore witness to this sad loss of life. Well, Paul rushed down, as did probably some of the others too. We might have said something like, uh, stand back, everybody, give him some air, stand back, give him some room. But not Paul. Um, it seems to be quite strange, doesn't it? But we read that Paul, uh, Paul did something very strange. 
different. His instant reaction is to fall upon the young boy. Did you read that? He falls upon him. He covers him. Um, but this is not as, str as strange as it might seem. And I'll tell you why. Because if we go back to the Old Testament, it is something that uh, a couple of the Old Testament prophets did. Elijah did the same thing to the son of the widow of Zarephath, who died. You can look at it later, 1 Kings 7. He laid himself on top of the boy and he was brought back to life, we read. How about Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4? He also had a similar uh, thing happened for the son of the Shumanite woman. Her son died. She sent for the man of God who laid on him and brought the boy back to life. Well, this man of God, Paul the Apostle, a student of the Hebrew Scriptures, laid on the boy and says, he's alive. And his life is restored to him. And this is the power of God. It's not the power of Paul. This, what, what this was, was designed to do was to authenticate Paul's apostleship and that he was a prophet sent from God, that he was given the power to restore life, that they may believe. So that he could say, now, do you believe who I really am? Well, there's a big celebration. His parents throw a party. No. No. If he was the prodigal son, um, that's what they might have done. The, his father said, my, my son was dead and now he's alive. And they threw a party. They, filled the, they killed the fatted calf, not Paul. What did they do? Did you read what they did? They returned to the upper room. They broke bread. And he continued speaking until daybreak. Just another day at the office for Paul the Apostle. Note, no one sat in the window. What a, what a God of grace and mercy. We see so clearly the love and the compassion and the tenderness of the Lord Jesus for his flock. His fledgling church, it was under pressure from all sides, from the Gentiles, from the Jews. They were being squeezed. They needed a sign and here was the sign that my apostle can restore the life of those who are dead. And they are encouraged in verse 12. And they are comforted. I suppose I ought to make a, a, a statement on, on this sort of thing. The elephant in the room very often is, and does the Lord work in this way today? People often ask it, don't they? Using men to bring others back to life, to heal those with terminal illnesses. Well, the, as I said, the purpose of this powerful encounter was to authenticate Paul's apostleship. And there are no apostles today. Does the Lord save lives in response to our prayers? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he does. He loves to hear the prayers of his people. Does he cure Illnesses in response to our prayers. Oh yes. Yes he does. And many of you have witnessed that, haven't you? How the Lord has healed you and others. Yes he does all those things. But he doesn't need a stadium to do it in. Well firstly we see a life saved. But secondly we see a life worth living. And Paul was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, as I said, where, where he would pass on the gifts from the churches. Uh, Jerusalem had been in, under persecution. They were very impoverished, and they appreciated the gifts from the Gentile churches to help them. He sailed down the west coast of Asia, or modern-day Turkey. They sailed for Assos, Chios, Samos, and arrived at Miletus, um, you probably don't know where they are. I don't know if you can see that. Probably not very well. But certainly there's Philippi up there. There's Troas. And he sails down the west coast to Miletus. If that helps. <laughs> and then what does he do? He calls the elders of Ephesus to meet him there. He didn't want to go into Asia. He didn't want to go back to Ephesus, so he calls them. 
it's a distance of approximately 36 miles. It's interesting to note that he calls the elders. It is a plurality of elders. We don't know how big the church was, but certainly uh, they had appointed elders for that place. And so Paul commences his farewell message to them in verses 19 to 20, uh, sorry, uh, 19 to 21. How this pastor loves them. How he loves them. How he would love to have stayed with them. His ministry amongst them was, we see straight away, a humble ministry. Did you see that? It was a humble ministry. He didn't ask for anything. He didn't demand anything of them. He didn't elevate himself, perhaps above the other elders. It was a humble ministry. He served them with tears. A mark of a compassionate minister for his flock. He wept for them. And when issues came up in the church, and they did, and they would in the future again, he prayed for them with tears. We see in these verses he was a, he was a, faith, it was a faithful ministry. He was a faithful minister. It wasn't plain sailing. Ministry never is. And like every pastor, he encountered storms and troubles. But here's the thing. He was faithful, and it was a teaching ministry. In verse 20, we read, He taught them everything that was needful for them to know. He committed the t- uh, to teaching them in public. He committed to teaching them in the house, house to house, privately, house groups. He would teach them. You may have noticed that Paul, on several occasions, uses... The phrase, you know. He says, you know. He committed uh, to teaching them. And then he says, remember, you know. That on several occasions, he wanted to remind them of his, that he lived an unblemished life with them. He wanted them to remember that no one could bring an accusation against him. Oh, he wasn't perfect. But according to the, to the world, we're talking about the, the, the world in which uh, they, were, they were living. Yes, he knew that he continued to sin and make mistakes. But he was saying, well, amongst you, I had a good testimony. It just made me think, have we got a good testimony? Are you able to sit here this evening and say, yeah, I've got a good testimony. Paul could say that. Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It seems to me that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, not just from morning till, till night time. He was filled with the Holy Spirit morning, noon, night, 24 hours a day. Oh, that people would say that we have a good testimony. But he reminds them of his continuing lasting message that alone brings salvation in Jesus Christ. And that is in verse 21. He says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, didn't he? He said, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that was his message. That was the gospel. 2,000 years later, it hasn't changed. Paul lived a life in the Spirit. Verse 22, he was so close to his Lord that the Spirit spoke to him. It was the Spirit that compelled him to go to Jerusalem, to warn him in advance that he faced opposition and prison and hardships. Surely only a man with the Holy Spirit could face these things. Reminded me, you know, of, um, of a little phrase in Acts chapter 9, verse 16. Um, Ananias is told to go to Straight Street and to uh, meet this man called Saul. And the Lord Jesus tells Ananias this thing. He says, I will show him, that is Paul, how much he must suffer for my name. Wow, what a burden. Could we bear that? If the Lord spoke to us and said, I'm going to tell you now everything that you are going to suffer for my name. 
tomorrow, next week, and next year. This is what you will do for me. I'm not sure we could bear it. Could, could we bear this? I'm not sure that without a, a, a filling of the Holy Spirit like Paul had, that we could bear something like that. To be told uh, about sorrows and discouragements and heartbreaks and to carry it with you. Is it too much? Paul could, because of his life in the Spirit. What about you? How closely are you with the Lord Jesus Christ? Is your spirit entwined with his spirit that you could bear those things? So Paul says to the elders whom he loves, go and do likewise. Verse 28, keep watch over yourselves. First and foremost, keep watch over yourselves. You too can fall. And then the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. And know that I, that after I leave, savage wolves, not just wolves, savage wolves will come in uh, among you and will not spare the flock. You see, this was a, a precious flock. It wasn't any old flock. All congregations and fellowships are precious In the sight of the Lord Jesus. And he says to them, watch over them. He says to them, feed them. And protect them. And that's what he says here. In this place. He says, watch over the flock. Feed the flock. Protect the flock. So we see a life saved. Secondly, we see a life worth living. And then thirdly, we see a life redeemed. And in verse 24, he says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. What, a, what single-mindedness. What a man. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace He says, and Paul was a recipient of God's grace, that's for sure. He knew what God's grace looked like. He knew what a transformed life looked like, that's for sure. God's grace, repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ were marks of his redeemed life. And the overarching pinnacle of this redemption was knowing that he'd been bought, that he'd been purchased by the shed blood of Jesus. He realized the astounding cost of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for him. How precious he was to him, the Savior, because of the ex- because of exorbitant cost. He was the recipient of the greatest purchase the world has ever seen. We've seen some big purchases recently, haven't we? People paying billions and billions of dollars for companies. But nothing compares to the purchase of his church by Jesus Christ at Calvary. While we were still dead in our sins, Christ died for us. He loved us and gave himself for us. Paul was the chief of sinners. How do we know that? Because he tells us. He tells us. He knew more than most what it was to be unexpectedly called out of darkness into his wonderful light. And Saul was on the road to Damascus, wasn't he? Not seeking God. You know, sometimes we think that we have to go to those and uh, help those who are seeking God. Well, God just broke into his life. In fact, he was seeking to destroy the church. He was seeking to uh, persecute God's people but God stopped him right where Jesus stopped him right where he was and perhaps there's someone this evening who has never been stopped in their tracks just where they are by Jesus Christ maybe you haven't heard his voice in quite the same way before oh you might have sung that wonderful hymn amazing grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Maybe you don't feel like a wretch. I remember when I was a teenager, uh, 
singing those lines and thinking, actually, I don't feel like a wretch. Those are pretty strong words, aren't they? I mean, I'm not so bad, am I? Maybe some of us, maybe others have thought that too. And now I've come to understand them. And Paul did too, that our lives lost our, we're just wretches. We can't do any good. There is no one who does good. No, not one. And Paul was relying entirely on the shed blood of Jesus for salvation. Entirely on his shed blood. And this is what spurred him on. This is what made Paul the man he was. Nothing else mattered to him except the gospel which proclaimed the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins and salvation. And have you come to that point in your life where you must accept the free gift of grace, faith through the, through the Lord Jesus Christ? They could flog him, and they did. They could imprison him, and they did. And they could kill him, and they did. But they could never silence him preaching the gospel. What a wonderful testimony that is, isn't it, from someone. And guess what? He still speaks today, doesn't he, through the pages of Scripture. Paul the Apostle will never be silenced. And I think the Ephesian elders knew that. They knew that this was a man of God. A man set aside to proclaim the gospel to all who would hear. And what did they do? We read in the last couple of verses of this chapter. When they had met with him, they fell on him. They embraced him. They kissed him through their tears as they realized that they would never see him again. At least... Not in this life. So when we, as we come to a close, what's the most important thing to you? Where is your treasure laid up? Is the Lord Jesus Christ everything to you? Or is the Lord Jesus Christ an important part of my life, but of course my job's important and I need enough money to live? And, uh, you know, where is your treasure? What is it in? Paul the Apostle, I want to know nothing, nothing but Christ and him crucified, he said.